This module will continue to cover basic common clinical problems encountered in amphibian medicine and their treatments or preventions. Bacterial diseases and idiopathic syndromes were covered in Part 1. This part will cover nutritional disorders and supportive care. Both presentations are oriented mainly towards N-urines, but many problems occur in all amphibians. This module is intended for veterinarians. While the information may help to educate non-medical personnel about the purposes of various procedures, the practice of veterinary medicine and the performance of the techniques described should be reserved for licensed veterinarians only. It should also be noted that all of the photographs in the presentations were obtained during routine clinical procedures as veterinarians were caring for ill amphibians. The common conditions and diseases reviewed in this module will include nutritional disorders including hypovitaminosis A and metabolic bone disease, and general supportive care. Before talking about nutritional disorders, we should review some basic nutritional guidelines for amphibians. One of the most important nutrients to consider in amphibians is calcium. The calcium-phosphorus ratio should be 1.5 to 1 or better. Many commercially raised invertebrates are low in calcium and high in phosphorus. One procedure for correcting this imbalance is gut loading. This is done by feeding the invert a high calcium diet prior to feeding it to the amphibian. The goal is to raise the calcium content of the diet to up to 2% on a dry matter basis and so correct what would be an inverted calcium phosphorus ratio in untreated invertebrates. Gut loading diets are not complete and can be lethal to the prey, so they should only be fed for up to 48 hours before feeding them out. The other main method for increasing calcium content of amphibian diets is to dust the prey with a calcium powder immediately prior to feeding out. This may be the only option for some invertebrates, but the powder does not stay on the prey for very long as it may fall off or be groomed off rapidly. Some prey items, such as earthworms and possibly pinhead crickets, have a better calcium phosphorus ratio and may not need gut loading or dusting, but adult crickets are mostly phosphorus. Vitamin supplements may also be required depending upon the species of amphibian and the prey being fed. In particular, vitamin A is often deficient and leads to health problems if the diet is inadequate. Dusting prey items with crushed beta-carotene tablets is often used, though in some cases individual animal treatment with topical vitamin A may be required. Some additional nutritional notes include the following. Aquatic invertebrates may be treated with a salt bath prior to being fed out to reduce parasite transmission. The natural history of the species should guide feeding methods. Feeding times should be appropriate. It is not optimal to feed in the morning for species that would normally eat at dusk, for example. Only feed what can be eaten in a single feeding. Crickets that remain in the tank for more than a day will have no nutritional value and will be a net energy drain for the animal. Also note that prey must be fed live. Amphibians will not eat dead or non-moving prey. Likewise, the prey size needs to be appropriate for the species. Items that are too small or too large at best may not be eaten, and at worst may cause obstruction of their GI tract. The most commonly seen nutritional disorder is metabolic bone disease or nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. The disorder stems from a problem with either calcium or vitamin D metabolism. Low body calcium levels can result from either a low dietary calcium or a high dietary phosphorus levels. A vitamin D deficiency can stem from inappropriate lighting causing an inadequate amount of conversion of vitamin D or from too much vitamin A in the diet which will interfere with the absorption of vitamin D. Clinical signs of this syndrome may include tetanic or flaccid paralysis, particularly after excitement or exercise, bloating from impaired GI motility, fractures or bending deformities of the jaw or long bones, or cloacal prolapse. Diagnosis is confirmed with radiographs indicating abnormally shaped bones, thin cortices, poor bone density, or fractures. The treatment consists of correcting the diet or underlying problem. The UV requirements for amphibians are largely unknown, 
but if a vitamin D metabolism problem is suspected, increasing access to unfiltered UVB lighting may improve the condition. In the short term, calcium supplementation orally as bath treatments or injectably may be required, especially in cases of tetany or bloat. It may also be necessary to provide vitamin D supplementation. Another common nutritional disease is hypovitaminosis A. A lack of appropriate amounts of vitamin A in the diet leads to squamous metaplasia in various organs. The most studied manifestation of this condition is the short tongue syndrome seen in Wyoming toads. The squamous metaplasia leads to decreased mucus production of the tongue, which makes it difficult for the frog to catch prey items. Conjunctival swelling is another manifestation of this syndrome. Treatment consists of supplementing vitamin A. This can be done by dusting prey items with crushed beta carotene tablets, though other methods such as misting with a liquid formulation or individual topical administration have also been tried. We'll now go over some basics of supportive care. Fluid therapy is the first and most important step when presented with a sick amphibian. Amphibian ringer solution is designed to be isotonic for most amphibians and can be made from the salts shown here. Some companies also sell pre-mixed ARS in bottles, which saves much time in measuring the various salts involved. Soaking in ARS is generally the most appropriate means of supporting hydration in a sick amphibian, though intravenous or intracelomically administered fluid may also be given in larger specimens. If the animal is too sick for diagnostics, a shotgun approach to treatment is often used. This approach includes fluid support, a broad spectrum systemically administered antibiotic, and systemically administered calcium with or without vitamin supplementation or corticosteroid administration. It is best to have a thermal gradient within which the animal can move, but if it is immobile or a gradient is not possible, it is better to err on the side of being cool rather than too hot with these patients. Depending on the history of the animal and the collection, it may be worthwhile treating with metronidazole or antifungals. In any case, diagnostics should be performed once the animal is stable to help refine the treatment plan. If the animal is not eating, nutritional support should be provided. Crushed prey can be assist fed by placing the item in the mouth or at the back of the throat if the animal will swallow. This is often the safest method of nutritional support. Alternatively, tube feeding can be performed using an appropriately sized tube, catheter, or feeding needle, but care needs to be taken to not cause trauma. A high caloric supplement for carnivores should be used, such as products made by Emirate or Oxbow, or a meat-based baby food. A number of useful references and resources regarding amphibian medical problems are listed here. Additional resources can be found at the Amphibian Arc website. Thank you for your time and attention, and good luck with your future amphibian projects.